Good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming to our talk. This is Decoding Distributed Systems. I am Zoe Vance. I'm the product manager for Rabbit MQ for Pivotal Cloud Foundry. And this is my illustrious colleague, Maria Dalla, a software engineer on the Pivotal Kubernetes contributions team. The motivation for the, oh, and thank you to Denise Yu for the lovely personas uh, on, the, on the screen. Um, the motivation for this talk was to take a slice of an incredibly broad topic, distributed systems, and take the slice that we spend most of our time thinking about and talking to users about, which is distributed systems in the context of enterprise applications. And given enterprise applications and the three personas you, you find often associated with those, an operator of a stateless application, an operator of a stateful data service, and application development teams, what are the trade-offs that those different personas need to make and the questions they need to ask when designing distributed systems? As well as what are the things that, let's say you are one of those personas, will help give you a little bit of empathy to the considerations being made on teams that aren't your own but are uh, in collaboration and in support of your own. So that was a little bit of the motivation for this talk. So we're defining distributed system here as more than one computer, by which mean, we mean that the processes don't share resources, and that the, those more than one computers are acting as a cohesive system and providing a cohesive output for a user. And while you know, distributed systems have become incredibly hot recently, these concepts have actually been around for quite a while, especially the ones as we're talking about today. So as I mentioned, I'm the product manager for RabbitMQ for PCF. Erlang, which is what RabbitMQ was built off of, um, was actually developed in the 80s for telecom programming and was specifically designed for massively scalable, highly available systems, which is why it was chosen for Rabbit. So when people talk about distribution, sometimes there's a tendency to talk about it as if it's a binary. And there's really quite a spectrum of distribution. And we're going to walk through today what that spectrum looks like. So at one end of the spectrum, you kind of have a single computer. You know, this is like an you know, old school computer. All your processes are on this computer. Life was simple. Life was good. You had a single user, single functionality. And then more users wanted access to that functionality. And here you see the client server model. And most people don't think about this as a distributed system, but it is a step on that spectrum because of the motivations for many users have access to a single functionality. And um, while we're playing bingo buzzwords, buzzword bingo, one thing we want to note here, it's a side note, but people talk about serverless. And what they really mean um, is that the location and the life cycle of the server is abstracted from the system rather than that there, there isn't one. Just a fun fact for your day. <laughs> so moving on along that spectrum of distribution, the motivation for this next distribution was the idea that, OK, you have your back end. How do you break up that back end and the functionality that it's completing such that different teams with different expertise can focus on, focus on specific responsibilities and you can move a little bit faster by moving in parallel? And here you see a very similar, a very common architecture, which is the multi-tier. You have three tiers, oftentimes the most common, presentation tier, the business logic tier, and the data tier. Continuing with that motivation of modularity and separate, uh, separate responsibilities, you then get into microservices. And this is where we're talking about, we're focusing our talk today, service-oriented distributed architectures. And again, the motivation is how do I split up my responsibilities such that we can kind of move faster in parallel. At the same time, you have the distribution of the data tier, motivated by the desire for availability and re resiliency of your data, where the leader follower patterns come into play. We'll touch on this a little bit later. And then finally, at the far end of the spectrum, you have peer-to-peer -peer systems. Um, these are you know, where all the hotness is, uh, Bitcoin, blockchain, torrent. This is unfortunately not where we're focusing, but very exciting nonetheless. And the reason this is the far end of the spectrum is the client is actually becoming a node in the system. So any talk about distributed systems is often the term microservices really goes hand in hand in that, with that. And the reason for that is that even though distributed systems is about a deployment topology and microservices are about application architectures, they're used so frequently in conjunction and to complement each other that you can't really talk about one without the other. 
And much like we talked about the uh, spectrum of distribution, you have the spectrum of microservice architectures as well. You have the monolith on the left moving over to you know, various degrees of separation of functionality on the right. So going back to the motivations, because we're trying to keep this talk tied to the motivations for why you would want to do these things, not just these things in the abstract. The motivations for microservices, uh, one of them is independent components. So you have components that are, uh, have independence in terms of their development, so maybe they change at different rates. You have components that have independent testing, uh, so such that their life cycles might look quite different. Uh, you could have components that have different runtime requirements, so the scale or the purpose that they're trying to complete could even mean that they're written in languages fit for purpose. A second motivation would be to isolate your dependencies, so to prevent cascading failures if part of the system goes down, or um, especially to provide cushioning for unreliable external dependencies. And when you think about designing microservices, the common guidance is to take the context that was completed by your, the context that was covered by your application, think about the bounds, the logical bounds within that context. And you come up with these smaller divisions, these bounded contexts for which each microservice um, takes responsibility. And those microservices are loosely coupled in that they can move and uh, take control of that, move and serve that bounded context independently as long as they're maintaining interfaces such that they can communicate and collaborate together. So we talked a little bit about those two spectrums, so distribution and microservices, and now we want to talk about why enterprise applications look to distribute. So the first thing is uh, efficiency of resources. So if you think about an e-commerce website that has a huge traffic spike on Black Friday, I, have, I as the uh, application owner, have two options without distribution. The first option is I have a small server that meets the need 364 days of the year, and on Black Friday I say good luck or goodbye to most of my user base, or I have an enormous server and 364 days of the year I am over-resourced. So when you think about adding more nodes, you can actually scale out and scale in such that your Deployment topology is matching the needs of your user base. The second reason that we see enterprises adding more nodes is for availability and redundancy. So, you know, hardware failures will happen, and is your system going to stay up when that happens? So Comic Relief, a UK-based charity, has, you know, one week a year where they get most of their donations. And we collaborated with them a little while ago, and the driving consideration is this cannot go down during this week. And how do we make it such that despite any hardware failures, despite the world ending, we're still getting those donations? The final motivation that we often see for enterprises looking to distribute applications is the idea that you can put nodes in different geographies. The first reason for that being that you can actually serve users from nodes that are close to them. So an Australian user can have an Australian server and be served quite quickly. The second motivation, actually, with more and more regulation coming in, um, is having your respecting the geographic regulations based on where your users are and keeping the data close to them as, uh, as is required. And I'm sure many people here were affected by GDPR. So we've talked a little bit about why we see enterprises want to do this. And now we're going to comment on the trade-offs to think about while you're making these decisions. So any distributed systems talk would be remiss to not talk about Cap Theorem, which is a useful framework for thinking about the trade-offs you make when you distribute a system. Uh, it states that you can have any two of three of the Cap guarantees, which is consistency. Every client sees the same data at the same time after a read or an update. Availability, which is that every request received by a non-failing node receives a non-error response and partition tolerance, which is that the system continues to run despite partial network failure. While this is a useful framework, in reality, you can't have a system in production that doesn't, opt, uh, that doesn't account for partition tolerance. And that is because networks will fail, people will plug cor uh, unplug cords at data centers, network cards will uh, fail, <laughs> And as apparently was happening until recently, which I did not know about, there were uh, shark-related threats to connectivity, which apparently will take down a, an entire region, but has now ceased to be a threat, so we can all rest easy. So when you think about the fact that networks will fail, hard, hardware is unreliable, you have to you reframe Cap Theorem a little bit to say, 
given a partition, is your system optimizing for consistency or is your system optimizing for availability? And in, uh, given there is no network partition, there's a similar kind of framing, which is, is your system optimizing for consistency? So you're going to give the, every user the exact truth, even if it's slower, or are you going to give the user an approximate truth, but much more quickly? And you see there's no right answer here. You see many different systems making different decisions based on their needs. For example, Genfire, for example, Genfire optimizes for consistency, whereas Redis um, HA will optimize for speed. So the reason why, um, to dig a little bit into networks and the issues around consistency and availability, there's a really helpful uh, framing of this that was done quite a while back. It was called the Byzantine Generals Problem. And this is to like, bring to life a little bit some of the trade-offs you need to make when you're in a distributed system. And the Byzantine Generals Problem states that given the Byzantine army is around a city and different factions of that army are at different points of the city, and each faction has a general. Let's say that you are a Byzantine general. And if you're attacking the city, unified attack or unified retreat will be a success, but a partial attack will lead to failure because you can't pull off the attack and you know, the army will be decimated. So you're a Byzantine general and you send off a messenger to the other general saying, let's retreat. How would you know that that messenger made it? And simultaneously, let's say a messenger comes to camp saying, attack. How do you know that that messenger wasn't turned by the defending city? Or that there are 100 messengers all saying retreat that didn't make it to you? We're not going to go too much into this, but this leads, to a field call, this leads to a field in distributed computing called consensus. And consensus is a couple of questions. Essentially, is the system in a state where truth can be agreed upon? If so, what is that truth? And if not, does the system return an error or a partial truth? Which gets us back to consistency or availability. And now Maria is going to talk a little bit about complexity. Yes. Cool. Thank you. Hi, cool. Um, so great, so with these definitions and with these trade-offs in mind, let's move on to the part of the talk that says just how complex and, so, and how hard um, distributed systems are, because they do come with a lot of value and a lot of advantages, but also with a lot of overhead and a lot of failure awareness that might make the trade-offs not worth it. Uh, let's look at a few aspects that become very complex once your topology goes from single node to various flavors of distribu distributed. The first one is around logging and monitoring. Uh, as you have more components communicating with each other over the network, messages and exceptions might occur at any point in that system and might be mutated at any point in that system and might travel a lot, which makes it quite tricky to track them and debug your system once you're noticing something going wrong. A very successful pattern in that area is to pretty much stamp everything with uh, a unique ID that it then carries with it as the message travels across the, the system. Um, so you can trace it and then you can also filter by that when it reaches a remote endpoint. Aspect number two that becomes quite tricky is security, and that is for a couple of different reasons. The first one is that more computers simply means more entry points for an attacker. It means a larger attack surface. Also, communication over the network, again, open up, opens up space um, and opportunity for those messages to be intercepted. Patterns that are very common and very successful here is to secure, ideally, any communication that leaves the boundaries of a computer, but prioritizing the most crucial one, the one that um, communicates secrets. And secondly, aiming for as little state as possible to be stored on nodes, particularly, again, around credentials and secrets. Uh, and that, again, is a pattern that will help with um, scaling a, a specific component. Another uh, point that becomes quite tricky is what the actual code, what the software functionality that runs on a distributed system looks like. Uh, what do I mean by that? On a single node architecture, your code might have had access to things like previous transactions, um, session state, things like that, that it can look at to be informed 
uh, and make decisions. That is no longer possible or it become, can become very expensive in a distributed context. So it is quite important to make refactor code and make it as idempotent as possible and, as, uh, and giving it as little dependence on context as is possible. Uh, just one last note on, on complexity and what it means in real production systems. This is a quote by John Olspo from Etsy. And for the Etsy development team, when they, when they balanced out um, advantages and disadvantages and looked at where it made sense for them to go on the microservices architecture spectrum, it ended up that they benefited most by not an entirely monolithic approach, but an architecture that was closer to a monolith on the spectrum compared to other um, development teams, which is quite interesting. Okay, so for the last part of the talk, we're going to put the patterns and the theory that we just, we just looked at into practice. And we're going to do that by looking at three examples of work that software teams do that touches on distributed topologies. Uh, and for each one of these examples, we're going to look at a couple of things. Uh, we will look at the motivation and the value that the teams would hope to get by moving to a dist distributed topology. We're going to look at what challenges they might face. And last but not least, we will look at patterns and frameworks and tools that they have at their disposal. OK, so first use case is that of an operator that scales a stateless application. Uh, stateless mean that there's no, well, there's no state and no syncing up to worry about. We looked at the values and motivations uh, earlier in the talk. We saw how uh, having a multitude of nodes being able to do the work that one node was previously doing, or in other words, forming a resource pool that can now answer to requests, uh, means a couple of things. It means that that resource pool is going to be overall healthy and up and running and available more of the time compared to a single node. So you have increased availability. Uh, and there's also increased elasticity in the sense that it can grow and shrink in size to accommodate changes in the load and the, uh, the traffic that it might be, <clears throat> excuse me, that it might be receiving. Um, your cluster might start by looking something like this. So you have an additional node that hosts the same type of software as the original one. The first question that pops up is, well, OK, good. How do my clients know how to speak to this new node that has come into life? A common pattern here is that of load balancing. So uh, you would introduce a component in your distributed system called the load balancer. Uh, and its responsibility is, on the one hand, to represent the resource pool to the outside world. On the other hand, to check the health of the resource pool and uh, delegate requests to the nodes accordingly. OK, so then as an operator, uh, my next question would be, well, how do I inform my load balancer about changes in the resource pool? How do I tell it, hey, you should start sending traffic to that new node that I have just added, or you should stop sending traffic to uh, that node that no longer exists? Um, a very common pattern in this area is that of service discovery, which is a, an end-to-end -end process for distributed systems where a component comes into place called the service registry. And that component keeps track of what actual nodes in the system offer what functionality. And then anything that needs to send requests to those components um, is going to consult the service registry or even be collocated with it and live at the same place. Excellent. So we, um, we very expertly avoided the hard stuff. We avoided state for the first example, and that was uh, very beneficial. Uh, so we're going to give it some attention for the second one, where we're going to look at a team that designs and operates stateful services. For example, uh, a cluster of Redis instances or a cluster of RabbitMQ message queues. OK, values and motivations first. Why would somebody bother with splitting up the data layer into pieces? Well, there are a couple of reasons that are interesting. The first one is um, to improve data access speed and to decrease latency, to get an answer from the data essentially sooner. Um, the word sharding uh, ends up popping up in this use case, um, and it's a very interesting concept. It is really just splitting up a huge uh, block of data that all lives together into smaller pieces. 
However, a small caveat here is that sharding is actually a partitioning of the data, not a distribution. Uh, so while it answers the question of can I get my access to my data faster, it's important to deal with each uh, shard as a separate distributed system. The second value, the second motivation behind breaking up the data layer into smaller pieces is to improve availability, to improve the chances that you will get some answer somewhat correct more of the time compared to one node holding your data. Uh, a very common pattern here is replication, and it comes with many different flavors again. Uh, but really, if we were to really simplify it, it means that where you had a node holding the data, you have a multitude of nodes, a cluster of nodes that all hold the same or about the same copy. Um, the challenge is now is really answering the question of what happens when a node from the cluster goes away. And again, there are a couple or a few rather different approaches depending on different products out there. So let's look at a few of them. Uh, first of all, let's look at a RabbitMQ cluster uh, that has suffered a partition due to um, a network failure and is broken into two. RabbitMQ can be configured to offer many responses to that situation. Uh, two interesting ones are coming up. The first one focuses on availability, offers, offers or focuses, sorry, on offering an answer, uh, and it's called auto-heal. What will happen in this case is that the cluster will be broken up in two, and the two partitions will continue living and evolving and growing separately. Um, and then once the system is back to normal, the uh, minority partition, the smaller partition, is going to drop its data. But throughout the partition, no matter what node gets connected, an answer will come back from the system. A second approach that RabbitMQ offers is that of post-minority, which focuses on consistency, focuses on giving either the right answer or no answer at all. And in that occasion, the uh, minority, the smaller partition, is just going to go completely offline, it's going to become unavailable, and is going to respond with errors in any requests that it gets. Um, another approach is that of a highly available Redis configuration using Sentinel, so a cluster of Redis. Redis uses, first of all, focuses on availability, focuses on giving uh, an answer as close to the truth as possible in the event of uh, network failure. And it does that by implementing a leader follower um, architecture where you have a leader in a node and all clients will write to that and then a set of followers that copy data essentially every now and then from the leader. Um, Sentinel will then spot that something might be wrong with the leader at some point, and it will automatically fail over to one of the followers and promote that follower to the leader of the cluster. But at no point are there uh, any rejected requests. Okay, so for the last example, let's look at an application team that is uh, developing an application within a microservice ar um, architecture context. Um, this is an interesting one. We're looking at a different level almost to what we've been looking at until now. So we're looking at the way that the code is architect architected and structured versus the underlying infrastructure, sorry, the underlying um, topology that supports it. Uh, but it is interesting to see how the two have similarities and differences and then how also they tie together. Uh, just a heads up before I go into this last bit that when I say service within this context, I mean a service as a component within the context of a microservice architecture. Um, okay, so challenge number one is that within a microservice architecture, services are going to communicate with each other a lot and they're going to ask functionality from each other a lot. Um, it, it can become quite cumbersome to change configurations so that they can tell each other what sort of functionality they offer. So a very common pattern here is a service registry, similarly to distributed topologies. Um, and that, again, helps with an end-to-end -end, uh, service discovery setup. A second challenge is uh, coming from the fact that there is, again, a lot of messages and a lot of communication flowing between components in a microservice architecture. Um, 
And why is that tricky? Well, imagine that uh, a component in the system starts failing and starts dropping requests. Or imagine that the system is under a, uh, an attack, a distributed denial of service attack and it's getting a huge uh, influx of, of traffic coming into it that it cannot cope with. Um, this can be quite dangerous because it might mean that it overwhelms the, the network and the, and the system and it might mean that the failures start cascading as more and more packets are uh, getting queued up. A very common pattern that we see in microservices for that is that of the circuit breaker. The circuit breaker is a component that essentially can look at, can, can identify cascading failures in the system it can identify that they are um, related to a call to a specific function and it can then stop calls to that function until uh, the service is essentially back to normal and is able to handle traffic again. A third challenge to look at uh, is that of storing configuration for services. Why do they need that? They essentially, um, microservices would rely on configuration so that they get the information they need to collect to the databases, to collect to message brokers, and as we saw just a moment ago, to, um, to service registries to announce that they are alive and offering a service. Um, a configuration server is a very common pattern, again, that we see in, uh, just in, sorry, in microservice architectures. Uh, and the idea is that, first of all, it can store that configuration centrally, but it can also uh, allow for backups and restores of that configuration, for updates, for versioning, and all of that can happen completely transparently to the microservices that consume that information without them needing to be updated in any way. That is a lot of work, and luckily, a lot of the heavy lifting happens with, uh, with frameworks that make developers' jobs easier. Uh, specifically for Spring developers, there's a split Spring Cloud Services framework that um, comes prepackaged with a lot of goodness, a lot of uh, libraries that help um, bring those components to life. And in specific, it comes with a circuit breaker dashboard, a configuration server, and a service registry. Okay, as we're coming to time, I'm just going to, uh, to talk about two takeaways that we'd like you to leave here with. The first one is to remember that everything that we talked about today is not really a definition, but rather a spectrum. So distributed services, are, uh, so distributed topologies are a spectrum. Microservice architectures are a spectrum. Every single node on the CAP theorem is itself a, a spectrum. Um, except for partition tolerance. Uh, so deciding where topologies and where the code architecture falls on any one of these uh, scales really depends on the special needs and, and motivations of the application, of your development team, and eventually of your users. And secondly, distributed application, uh, distributed topologies bring a lot of value, but also a lot of challenges and overhead with them. Um, so something to keep in mind is perhaps it's not worth complicating a topology just because it's possible, um, and it might be worth allowing a system to start pushing its limits and start showing that its current topology is not quite working for it anymore uh, before taking on, making the decision to take on additional overhead. We, I think we might be at time now. We'd like to thank you so much for coming to our talk today. Uh, we would love to catch you later or over email and talk about this or anything uh, in more detail. We'd also appreciate your feedback very much, so please let us know if you'd like to chat. Um, thank you and enjoy the rest of the conference.